Great. Yes, let's do, let's do it. Let's do it. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending the session. Meet the woman in sport. Record, breaker, and role model. I'm Severin Dibuy. I'm the chief executive officer of TAC, an international company I created 13 years ago. DSC, specializes in strategic economic intelligence and lobbying. I've been a cycling champion. I, win, I won five stages in Tour de France, and I have won two-time best climber. Yes, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I wear the T-shirt with these beautiful red dots. <laughs> and yes, yeah. Yes. Thank you. And here, that is my role. I'm the general manager and ambassador for women in sport, for the organization women for, for of the Women Forum. What is the initiative of Women Forum? And why now? It's a focus in the closing the gap between high-level executives and top athletes around the world. 15 years ago, women, women represented only 2% at Olympic Games. Last year's women represented 49%. This is a step in the right direction, but there is still a long way to go. Even in a sport, at director level, in a club, in a federation, and institution. The woman percentage is very low in the business world, at board level or top position. Still, women are mom and champions. Women of the same skill as men. An athlete has a sport plan, which usually employ of preparing for several years to reach high level in a competition or even the Olympic. Executives like you also have a plan. You have a career plan, which also can take care of yours. How initiation, women in sport, look at closing the gap between sport and these executive world. Athletes, champions, have a lot of quality, learning, and value that they can bring to the executive world and top management. Tonight, we will be listening to the specific example of the world model women that have uh, succeeded in business and are talent champion athletes each of them will share their difficulty and victory and how they have succeeded but before that i would like to reintroduce norma who will really meet this afternoon Norma will close the session with a summary we will do, we decide to do together and take question and answer from the public. Picture a better than a world. I propose we watch a short video on this incredible woman. Thank you.
I needed to do this against human trafficking. People really don't understand that this is something that can end. The salt is eating my gums. I wanted to look like Angelina Jolie, but I think I look more like, you know, <laughs> Mickey Rose on the, the wrestler. That's probably how I look. <laughs>
under temperatures down to minus 40 degrees Celsius. Seven years ago, I explored Antarctica, the coast of Antarctica. This first experience in Antarctica gave me the desire to go further south, to discover this continent, to know the reality of this continent. You must know that the heart of the continent itself is extremely different from the coast, especially because there is no animal at, at all, no life at all, no penguin, for example. I read all explorers' books about exploration in Antarctica, but I really needed to experience Antarctica, to experience the continent. That's why I had a crazy idea. I decided to cross Antarctica to the South Pole over 2,045 kilometers on ski without kiting. Without kiting means without, without the support of the wind. This objective was very challenging. I love extreme endurance. I often uh, run over long distances for 24 hours, 30 hours. I often participate in ultra trail races over 150 kilometers, 200 kilometers. But this challenge was much bigger, much more difficult. Antarctica is the windiest, driest, highest, coldest continent on Earth. Since the South Pole was reached for the first time in 1911, less than 10 explorers have attempted to cross Antarctica on ski without the support of the wind, without animal. Today, explorers generally use a kite to take advantage of the wind and then travel a longer distance, 100 kilometers every day or 200 kilometers every day. I could have been discouraged by the list of adventurers who died in Antarctica. I could have been discouraged when a potential sponsor told me that he, uh, told me that he, he could not uh, support the expedition because there was a risk I could die in Antarctica. I could have been discouraged when I read uh, the book written by Reinhold Messner, a great Italian alpinist, who described his expedition across Antarctica as much more difficult than all his mountaineering expedition, including the ascent of Mount Everest. I could have listened to the people who told me that this project is impossible, especially for women. In when it comes to polar adventure and adventure in general, women are sometimes discouraged from attempting risky expedition and long expeditions. Sometimes I felt really that some men were worried that a woman, that I could be successful when they are not. And I mean, we are, take, we are talking about physical endurance and being strong in one of the most extreme places on Earth. And I can tell you, it's not a question of testosterone. It's a question of mental strength. I never gave up. I prepared the expedition as much as I could. I trained. I ran in a cold storage facility in Rangis, starting at 5 a.m. in the morning before going back to the office where I, uh, um, I, I work uh, as a lawyer. I pulled tires. I prepared uh, the um, financing. I prepared the communication. I prepared the logistics. I convinced 50 sponsors to support the expedition. I went to a bank to negotiate a huge loan to close the expedition budget. That was a great entrepreneurial project. And on January 27, 2015, after three years of preparation and 74 days of skiing, almost uh, three months, I reached my goal. I crossed Antarctica through the South Pole over 2,045 kilometers on ski without kiting. I had to ski from 8 to 16 hours a day, sometimes sleeping only four hours at the end of the expedition because I had to hurry in order to um, get the latest plane uh, of the season. I had to um, 
I had to get around the, the crevasses and to uh, cross the ice uh, uh, waves shaped by the wind. I had sometimes to ski with no visibility at all in total whiteout. I had to overcome many other obstacles, sometimes unexpected. For example, uh, the beginning of the expedition, uh, I had a fever and a flu, and uh, it was not part of the initial plan. Uh, one of the tent poles uh, break broke and uh, made a hole in the tent fabric in the middle of the expedition. It was not part of the initial plan. I broke uh, one of my teeth and it was very painful for one month. It was not part of the initial plan. <laughs> I had to fight against the extreme weather conditions especially when temperature dropped below minus 50 degrees Celsius. I had to ski against a cold and strong wind that pushed me back again and again. I was uh, very uh, hungry. My body weight was only 40 kilos at the end of the expedition. Never, I had never been so close to my limits. This expedition is now referenced on the Guinness World Book of Records as the longest ski expedition for a woman in Antarctica without kiting. And I am now part of the few explorers <laughs> who reached both the geographical North Pole and geographical South Pole. But I was not uh, looking for records. I lived for 74 days a simple life without comfort, just skiing, sleeping, and eating. I felt alive. I felt total accomplishment. There were a lot of obstacles in this project, but the accomplishment, the outcome, the experience is compensating all the obstacles that have to be overcome. I wrote a book and I directed a movie. It's not about motivating people to cross Antarctica, obviously. It's about uh, inviting everyone to live intensely without fear nor regret. I give talks in school and uh, in companies, notably to tell about how I overcome the obstacles during the expeditions and during their preparations. But I give talks also to deliver one key message. The only limit to your goals is the one you are setting. Everything else may actually be just an excuse of fear, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Sit down, please. Yeah. Um, now, just in pr 30 seconds, <laughs> because we have timing, it's like in a sport. Uh, what is your call to action? What do you want the audience here re to, rem to remember? Uh, what I've said, the only limit to your goals is the one you are setting. Uh, in fact, it's a w a one sentence is in my book, and I repeat it again and again because I believe that everybody can do a lot of things and we must be confident. Great, thank you. Now, we third um, guest and speaker, Kiko Hira. So who is Kiko? Kiko is female Japanese racing driver, an associate professor of Kyo University Graduate School Media and Design. Kiko, will you come join <laughs> on stage and and tell us about your experience from a model and racing queen groupies to race car driver. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Keiko Ihara. Uh, I'm a car race car driver. Um, <laughs> before. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <And> after. <laughs> wow. Uh, unfortunately, I got a lot of links. Yeah, <laughs> uh, 15 years ago, I was a fashion model um, because uh, I was a, a ski competitor for mogul skiing. And uh, I wanted to get a budget to practice uh, uh, to go to the mountain. So I became a model. But uh, in the first year, I couldn't get any job because I was not cute. <laughs> but I started to imitate uh, the top model. So after three years, uh, I always passed uh, any audition. So I became a uh, model. 
And uh, one of that job, um, I was a great girl, like an uh, umbrella uh, to stand uh, on the uh, circuit. And uh, when I went to the circuit first time, I was very surprised because the motor spot is so limited spots. And uh, the engineer, uh, mechanics, racing car driver uh, concentrate so much. So I thought I want to be a racing driver, even I couldn't, uh, I didn't have a normal driving license. <laughs> and uh, I started to uh, get a ma money. Uh, I had a lot of job uh, uh, models and uh, the clean the toilet or deliver the uh, baggage or something. And I saved a lot of money. And when I was uh, 25 years old, finally I started to race. But uh, it's uh, very late to start as an athlete. And, uh, but I had a very, very strong uh, determine because uh, I, I'm a very small female driver. I don't have enough physical, uh, physical strength and uh, too late to start the motorsport. So I had a lot of um, determined. And motorsports, I think a lot of people think just sitting. <laughs> but uh, uh, l we need a lot of physical because when I went to, I go to the corner in 300 km per hour, a lot of uh, lateral g-force push me uh, usually 300 kilogram push me. So if I lay down, I can't drive. So I have to use all muscle to um, uh, defense the force. And uh, the heart rate is more than uh, 160, usually 190. This is the uh, same with the uh, marathon, marathon uh, runner. And also there I have to have a lot of things during the race. Because I have to talk with the engineer and uh, to make a uh, decision uh, how can we change the setting for the machine. So talking and uh, uh, very high rate uh, um, heart rate and uh, think and a lot of things. And uh, so then um, I've been racing driver uh, in, in ten, ten after 10 years, I became uh, sick. Always, every day I had a high fever and a headache because uh, uh, motorsport, uh, female driver and the men driver have to complete the uh, same thing, same, same phrase. So it's too hard uh, for female. So I became uh, sick. And uh, I decided to stop the racing, uh, retired. And uh, when I come back to Japan, I was so disappointed. Uh, a lot of people uh, helped to me, supported to me, but I didn't, I didn't give back anything. So what should I do? Uh, because I became a sick, I cannot go anywhere. So I started uh, English school in my house. And uh, after four years, I became uh, very healthy because uh, when I was with uh, the children, I felt a lot of uh, possibilities. So if I beca uh, became uh, very healthy, of course, I start to think uh, I want to race again. <laughs> and uh, I was running a lot of things. So how uh, can I do uh, as a female driver? Okay, so. Uh, physical strength, I cannot uh, overtake the main driver, but I can integrate the lot of ability. So now I can control the uh, emotion by smell or emotion by blood glucose level or uh, muscle blood flow, or sometimes uh, I can control the sympathetic, uh, par parasympathetic uh, by music. And uh, I understand everything, uh, the how control their body and the brain. And uh, finally, I reached the top best race in the world, Le Mans 24 hours race in France. And uh, there are uh, 150 top men drivers are there. And uh, the female driver is only me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> and also, when I reached this uh, race. I was already 39 years old. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, the first year, I couldn't drive. 
uh, even one lap at all because the first driver was crashed. So <laughs> and the second year, I tried to get a lot of sponsors and uh, okay, second time, I want to finish the race, but uh, I done only three laps because the car was problem. And uh, after that, uh, the my husband uh, said to me, oh, okay, so male got in Luman, uh, men got, because uh, men got uh, doesn't want to uh, female driver success. <laughs> he was telling to me, uh, joking. But uh, the third time pays for all. And uh, I try to politely communicate with mechanic, engineers, everyone, uh, the team staffs. And uh, sometimes over 300 km per hour, uh, in the heavy rain, I cannot see anything, but I have to flat out. Uh, it's very difficult condition, but French guy, uh, who is a leader of the te uh, team, uh, he gave me a chance. Uh, I, I, I um, very difficult condition, in the very difficult condition, I drive. And the other two guys cannot drive because a uh, female driver is very consistent laps and the female driver can control the emotion and the female driver is always calm and clever. So he gave me a chance to drive. So, and uh, finally, I became a first female driver stand on the world uh, championship podium as a female driver. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, after that, uh, the I appointed uh, as a um, Women in Motorsport Commission uh, committee. And I started to work for FYA. And uh, the I spread the policy in Asia. And I started to ask uh, to collaborate uh, by car manufacturers. Because it's very important to get the help uh, from industry, car in the industry. So Matsuda uh, was the first um, first agree with this policy. So I started to uh, uh, recruit. There are a lot of drivers and the engineer or mechanics who works want uh, who want to work uh, uh, the car industry. So 18 years old to 68 years old applicants uh, came to apply, and uh, the over 500 people. And uh, I cannot grow the all, so I choose uh, 50 drivers. And now we are uh, doing the training. And uh, uh, after Matsuda agreed, uh, another car manufacturer starts to work, and uh, Toyota or BMW or Nissan uh, started to work. And now a lot of female drivers stand on the podium uh, in Asia. And uh, women in innovation, women in motorsports, I try to have a movement and uh, to scale up uh, for female driver by I IoT and science. And also I use, uh, I make her uh, integrate, uh, try to integrate uh, the uh, female power. And now I'm working for the Japanese government. And uh, the I made a forum like this, uh, not like this big, but the Women in Innovation Summit 2016. And I, I tried uh, uh, economy, society, and the STEAM, science, technology, e uh, engineering, uh, art, mathematics. So uh, now I'm yeah. gro growing up. And yeah. uh, finally, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, the, uh, now uh, this year I drive uh, the this car, but uh, with men. But uh, my uh, dream is to uh, race with uh, uh, like uh, female driver, young female drivers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kiko. Kiko must leave at 7 o'clock, so I propose to uh, continue with uh, Cecile Laguette. So I present her. Cecile is a female sailor, a uh, naval architect and engineer in composite material and ambassador of Magenta Project, which aim to support women in professional study. Cecile, can you join us on stage and talk about your project? Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, so my name is Cecile Lege, I'm a professional sailor and I'm also an ambassador for the Magenta project. Uh, basically we created that project over a year ago 
um, after one of the biggest offshore racing in the world uh, because we thought um, we can't just uh, leave all this knowledge and leave all of this experience go away. And because uh, sailing is very much a male-dominated world, it's still quite hard to break through, and we wanted to help uh, the younger generation and help other girls to uh, do like we do. Um, so um, basically this race called the Volvo Ocean Race, it is one of the toughest events in offshore sailing. It goes around the world. It's a nine months long race uh, with nine stopovers. Uh, you can see this the map here of the 2014-2015 uh, race. And the photo there is the boat uh, was sponsored by SCA. Um, and, uh, and then we, after, after the end of the race, SCA had some, uh, they were really happy with the return on investment on the project, but they had uh, internal things that they need to deal with and they decided not to carry on for the next race, which starts next year in 2017. So that's why we were, okay, we've got to do something. We can't just let this happen and stop because it was the first time in 10 years that there's been women in the race. Been 10 years, no women at race in the Volvo. Um, and if we didn't want this to happen again because basically we keep uh, climbing up the level and then suddenly there's no more women in the race and the level c drops back right down. Um, it's called the Magenta Project because the throughout the, the whole race, like the boat was obviously pink, but the designer kept telling us it's not pink, it's magenta. So we thought we'd make a little joke with the project. Um, right now, what we've ended up doing is uh, we are over 20 of us uh, women professional sailors right around the world, and it's the network is growing. We always get contacted by a female sailor around the world saying, we want to join you. How can we do? What can we do uh, for for improving women's sailing. And um, sailing is a sport, we've got three main disciplines. Um, the first one, as you most of you probably know, is the Olympics, and that's probably where there's most, mo most of the women sailors are in the Olympics, it's about 50-50. And then you move into Grand Prix sailing, and Grand Prix sailing is inshore uh, racing. The most famous race probably America's Cup. There's no girl in the America's Cup at the moment. And uh, and the other part is offshore racing. Uh, and so as you move into big boats, so you go from your dinghy level and then you move into big boats, there's fewer and fewer girls. And on the offshore racing, the big race, uh, most of you would know is the Vendee Globe. So that's solo around the world race. And then there's the Volvo Ocean Race. And there's also the Figaro class, which uh, a lot of people do before going on and doing those bigger events like the Vendee Globe. Um, so what we do with the Magenta project, um, we've got three main things we want to sort of uh, focus on. And the first one is to perform, because it's really important that we keep at the highest level, we keep performing, we keep racing on really fast yachts. Uh, now boats, if you follow a little bit of uh, the sailing, boats are foiling, so they're flying above the water. That was developed in the America's Cup in 2013. Um, so we're really pushing hard to compete on the highest and fast uh, on the fastest uh, yachts in the world, um, and all of us at the Magenta Project, we all sort of all have our different discipline or projects. So throughout our own discipline, we will keep pushing for the highest level. Um, the other thing we do is uh, we want to challenge the other girl sailor out there and say, hey, come and have a sail with us on those fast yachts. Come and see what it feels like and see if you like it and you want to push further. And we organize clinics as well. So with our own project, we'll invite some girls, coach them, teach them, um, and help them get to, get to the, the high level. And, uh, and also share our experiences, because I think from the outside, sailing is not necessarily a sport that's easy to access, or people know what uh, how to get there to the high level. So we really try and share our experience, share how we got there and why we got there. Um, and the last part is to inspire. Um, we all know uh, between ourselves so many young girls that have done dinghy classes and then or even been to the Olympics and then tried to transition to big boat sailing and got stopped because it is quite tough. Like you get confronted to you've got to prove yourself twice because you're a woman, so that's that's all right. But it, it can be quite tough sometimes. So a lot of them give up and we really want that to stop. We want them to the young girls that, that see us racing, we want, we want to be role model for them, and then we want them to say, okay, they're doing it, so I'll do it later. And, they, and through the inspiring as well is that as a sailor, you not only have to sort of set your sails and steer your boat and go off, you also have to be really technical because especially when you're racing offshore, you have to be a mechanician, elec electronician, you have to be able to fix anything on the boat. So it requires a lot of other skills as well. 
So we've just created the Magenta Onshore project to also show the girls all the technical role you can have either in a shore team and then take that further into uh, when you're racing, take that, take that offshore. And um, I also so I'll tell you a little bit more about how I got there, why I got into sailing, and uh, and why I'm standing here today. Um, I started sailing when I was 10 years old. Uh, my parents told my brother and my sister and I that now every summer we were just gonna go cruising. So they rented boats. We didn't. I didn't grow up near the sea. I grew up in uh, not far from Paris in the countryside. And uh, and that's the first I knew of sailing. It was just cruising with my parents, fishing and was quite fun and we just used to go in the med, go to, you know, cross to Corsica or the Balear Island and that's all I knew. And then uh, further up I was studying and um, I was at, at school and I was like, oh, yeah, what I want to do, went through like sort of all your <laughs> traditional ideas, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a whatever. <laughs> and then um, then I was like, I actually really love boats and uh, became a naval architect uh, and then I further pursued studying uh, in New Zealand, in Auckland, uh, doing composite engineering, just in the aim of always, you know, pushing for uh, racing and working with race teams. And then in parallel of this, I was racing a lot, like every opportunity I had, I was on the water, uh, competing in shore, offshore, and then uh, suddenly it became clear to me that, you know, I'll make the jump and then I'll go full-time professional sailing. Um, so I had the chance to be part of the Team SCA squad uh, for the last Volvo Ocean race. And then uh, at the end of the race, I was like, okay, what's the next step? How do you always keep on looking for performances, on looking at, as, as part of an athlete, you always have to learn. Um, and I decided to go in the Figaro circuit. So it's a few from France, you probably heard of the Solitaire du Figaro. Um, if you're not, they it's a quite a famous race in France. Basically, we all have the same boats. They're 10 meter long, and that's the photo you can see there. That was this year during the race. That's me, like sort of trying to do something to lure it there. <laughs> and um, and basically, it is one of the. It is a really really competitive uh, circuit. Some of the top sailors that are racing in the Vendée Globe, so this race around the world solo. They've been there. That's where they do their class. So French famous skipper like Michel Desjoyeaux, Franck Amar, François Gabart. They've all been there, they've all done the circuit. And I it was quite a, an undertaking for me because I'd never sailed solo before. Uh, and I also haven't been in France for 10 years. So I moved back in France since September last year and decided I'm gonna do this. Didn't have all the funding to do it, uh, to put quite a bit of personal money to back myself up, but that's what you do. You know, if you wanna do something, you've gotta just do more than just uh, say, I'm gonna do it. You do actually put all the means behind it. And then, uh, and then, yeah, teach myself how to race solo. And uh, and that was, you know, normally on boats like this, you have maybe six to eight people, and suddenly you're by yourself, and you're like, oh, that's different. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and uh, it, was, it was amazing. I got everything I wanted out of the project. Like I just learned so much in nine or ten months project. You've learned like your level goes through the roof, um, and you also get this big overview of being the skipper, the navigator, the you you also because you're running your own campaign, you're you know, you do all the budget planning, all the getting the commercial side, getting all the sponsors. Um, you're also your own sh short team. I didn't have a lot of budget, so I had to, you know, sort of prepare and fix the boat myself. Uh, and th that's great because you learn it the hard way, but then you know how to do absolutely everything. So it was absolutely amazing. Um, being on the circuit with the top sailors and I just can't wait to get back there next year and just transform everything I learned into performances. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Like, we are a little bit in late. I propose to put the question at the end oh with yeah. the public. Yeah. No, take care. So we are, con we are going to introduce um, the last speaker. It's Clarice Costa. Clarice is a former professional basketball player and representative of the high-level athlete program of Sciences Po. Clarice, could you join us stage to tell us about professional retraining. What did you make it? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me tell you how delighted I am to be with you tonight, and uh, how proud I am to be representing the high-level uh, athlete program of Sciences Po. Um, as Severin said, I'm an ex-professional basketball player. Uh, I'm 30 years old, and I'm quite happy to say that I've already had three lives. One as a professional basketball player, as mentioned, uh, another one as a Sciences Po student, and the last one, my current one, as an employee of the Paris Bid Committee for the, the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. So before getting into the retraining and how I make the transition, 
uh, I just want to say how it started, basically. It all started with a man, <laughs> okay? Uh, with my brother, who at the age of 12, suddenly decided to become the next Michael Jordan. I mean, a white version of it. Uh, so here I am, the last of his family of three, uh, thinking, well, I'm a girl, I'm white, but I can do it as well, you know? I want to follow my brother. So I went to the gym, subscribed, and I ended up playing basketball for the next 20 years, while my brother stopped two or three years after. So I think I made the right choice. Um, so I just want to stress the fact that basketball for me was a school for life, a school of life. I just learned everything through sport. Um, it, gives me so it gave me so much about um, basically uh, values of communal life, principle of communal lives, about tolerance, respect, about teamwork, how about leadership as well? Um, I was a kid, you know, I was practicing with boys as well. I learned how to say no. I learned how to lead a team. I was a point guard. And um, basically, I didn't realize it at that time, but all these things I learned were just the basis for my professional career, and not only as a basketball player. So I happened to be a pretty decent player. I got recruited at the local level, regional level, and then the national level. Uh, I went to the National Training Center, which is in Paris. Uh, it's called INSEP. And I represented France, um, well, European wide and worldwide, uh, which is just like completely amazing because I was using sport to travel, to discover, to learn, and to meet new people. So I signed my first professional contract at 18, 18 years old. Uh, I ended up uh, playing in Calais for two years, which wasn't the most exotic place <laughs> to start with. <laughs> Sorry if there is any Calaisian uh, <laughs> in this room. Um, but um, let me tell you about what it is and what it means to be a professional basketball player in France right now. Uh, we're pretty lucky. We have a professional league, which is well-structured. Uh, we make enough money to basically live out of it. Uh, we contribute to social security, we benefit from it. Um, it's quite, uh, we're quite lucky, I think, in terms of women's sport organization. But <coughs> basically, you wake up at like 8 or 9 a.m., you have breakfast, you go to the gym, you spend two or three hours there, okay? Then you come back, you have lunch, have a nap because you're exhausted. Then you go back to the gym, you train for two or three hours. And at the end of the day, well, you're exhausted, so what do you do? You go back home. <laughs> you have dinner, and then you crash. So, I mean, to me, this professional life was all about passion, it was about pain as well, and it was about performance. Because you're accountable, you're accountable to your team, to your coach, to your sponsors, uh, to your president. Um, I learned a lot, I learned a lot through it. Um, I also had a lot of injuries, which pushed me to actually question myself uh, when I was about 22, 23. What's next? Okay, you're playing now, it's pretty good, but you're not selling enough uh, to basically retire. So what are you gonna do? Well, I was just trying to figure out what to do with my life when I actually see a show on TV uh, which was promoting this program uh, run by Sciences Po, so a high level athlete program. And I thought, well, what is it about? I mean, how can athletes both study and keep playing or keep practicing their sport? Um, so I get to know more about it. Uh, I actually realized that it was a tailor-made program to help athletes go through their professional career and make the transition. And I thought, well, this is for me. Like, I want to do it. I want to get into this program and I want to get ready for the next part of my life. So I applied, I gave an interview. And let me tell you, the first time I actually arrived in front of Sciences Po door for an interview, I was just frightened. I was, I was so scared. I mean, uh, it's just like, coming from a totally different world and thinking, oh, I'm not credible, I'm legitimate, how am I going to do this? And everything worked fine. I mean, it's just, it was just an amazing opportunity which was, which was given to me, sorry, uh, to start a new life, to get an academic background, and to keep moving forward. And this is what I actually said during my next interview to get into the Masters of Sciences Po, so the classic academic program uh, with people with non-sporting backgrounds. And I have to say that, once again, everything I learned through sport about teamwork, about um, how to get people together to actually reach a common objective, about leadership, about respect, tolerance, uh, about effort as well, well, it helped me through 
going into Sciences Po and basically entering the workforce with, uh, I think, quite a solid background um, in terms of uh, skills. So what I want to stress is this thing about sports skills, which are actually transferable to um, the workforce, the normal professional life. I use it a lot, and I think that's why today I'm where I am. I'm working for the Paris uh, Beat Committee for the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games, and uh, I feel quite lucky actually to be able to do that now. So my last word would be about why, why should we invest in women's sports? Why should we promote it or support it? Well, I think there are four key points. Um, it's about building the next generation of leaders. Uh, it's not only about being leader in sports, but it could be also in uh, politics, in economics, um, in civil society. Uh, I think there's all these transferable skills which are really useful, and I invite you to check actually a survey which was made by um, ENY, which traced the sport background of a number of uh, CEOs in North America. Uh, second of all, um, it's a question of health as well. It's about uh, feeling well, uh, discovering your body, uh, taking control of your body as well, which is really important when you're a teenager, whether you're a boy or a girl. Third of all, it's also about women's rights. It's about having accessibility uh, to sport public infrastructure, having accessibility to public space, and I think this is still um, quite of a subject right now, even, even in France. And um, basically, I'm going to finish with something a bit lighter. Um, just women's sport is fun. I mean, I've been like seeing a lot of games, basketball, handball. Uh, I mean, I'm all about team sports. But uh, of course, with all this background, you see there's just much more with selling, driving, and all of that. It's fun. It's family friendly, children friendly. It's amazing. You can have a great time. And please, in the next six months, go to see women's sport. It's pretty great. Thank you. Thank you so much. What do you think? <laughs> well, um, I mean, I mean that was a great summary. Yeah, why invest in women's sports? I mean, it is fundamentally we just want the same access, and uh, you know, like the the next generation of leaders, and it's just the right thing to, you know, to treat women uh, uh, just as uh, you know, young girls should have the same opportunity. It should be up to them to to decide whether it, this is something for them. And even as a career, you know, it's, it's, it's great, uh, you know, in terms of growing up with self-seen issues and there's so many other things that, uh, you know, where empowerment that comes that, that, you know, like I love the fact that, you know, having a lifestyle like uh, that I have right now, it is impossible for me to be so positive and go do something amazing and then come and be negative on every aspect of my life. It seeps through it and, and it feeds the community as well. So what do you think? <laughs> So thank you. Thank you, girls. And uh, thank you to coming today, every day. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you, everybody.